So good evening, good evening, and welcome along to the big show here on NVTV. What a way to start the show this week. I'm standing on this fabulous staircase, this brand new staircase at one of Belfast's most iconic venues. We're here in the Grand Opera House. We're celebrating the fact that the Opera House is now back open for business and we're allowed back out to at last see some fabulous live entertainment. I'll be chatting to the Grand Opera House CEO, Ian Wilson, in just a second. But so what else is coming up? on the show this evening. We got TV presenter Carol Smiley. She's going to be with us. We'll have music from uh, Mary McShane and Amber Light. And as well as that, we'll be finding out how many hours a year we spend scrolling through the TV schedules, deciding what to watch. TV critic Boyd Hilton and behavioral psychologist Joe Hemmings is also going to be with us on the big show this evening. So here we are in this uh, fabulous auditorium here at uh, the Grand Opera House. We're going to find out all about the refurbishment now because I'm pleased to say we're joined by the CEO, Ian Wilson. Ian, great to be back and um, what a job you've done on the place. And I would imagine it's probably the most difficult and challenging time in your career, not only doing the refurbishment, but then COVID comes along in the middle of it all as well. It's been a very long 21 months, Robin. So the Grand Opera House closed for a 12.2 million pound restoration project on the 12th of January last year. Two months into the restoration project, then the pandemic struck very hard and uh, that meant a, a delay to the project. So we were due to open in time for pantomime last December, uh, but we only opened last week with six of the musicals, so there was a 10 month delay. So Ian, I was here for uh, the opening night and I have to say I was very impressed by the way yourself and your team dealt with all the people coming in and with all the COVID restrictions going on as well. Uh, it, it is, but the reality is that over the last number of months, the arts sector, uh, myself included, and colleagues have been working with the executive and pushing the executive for a reopening date without social distancing because that's the key to running the theatres. So at the end of the day, they gave us a date. They stipulated the regulations. So we are happy to obviously comply with those regulations because then it means we can open to full capacity. Before the 27th of September, when they announced that theatres could open to, uh, to full capacity, it meant social distancing. We are a 1,000-seat venue. We break even at 700 to 800 seats, and social distancing would have given us 350, 360 seats. So there's no way we could have worked within those parameters. So let's talk about uh, the restoration, because uh, the first thing that you notice when you walk through the doors is that fabulous staircase is there now. When Frank Matcham, who designed the Grand Opera House in 1895, one of his well-known traits was the very fact that when you walked into one of his auditoria, he always believed that the entertainment should begin when you take your seat. So that's why he surrounded people, enveloped people with stunning architecture. So we wanted to, as part of this restoration project, to create that sense of drama when you walked in to the front doors. And hence you do have that fa fabulous helical stair all the way up to the top floor. So we're here in the auditorium. The seats have changed, the lovely, nice, comfy chairs as well. But uh, one of the things that hasn't changed, we've done a great job in the restoration, is keeping all the original artwork and all the amazing stuff on the ceilings that every time you look up, you notice something different. It was really important that we didn't want to deviate from Frank Matcham's design because when you look at the, the inside of the auditorium, it is perfect. Uh, he was an extremely clever designer. Uh, most of us on an Oriental theme, of course, in Belfast. They were all different. Very sadly, he worked on over 100 projects during his lifetime. There are only 21 theatres of his that exist. Uh, I personally feel that he's given us his most iconic uh, building, I would say that, but I'm biased. But when you look around and see all of that beautiful decoration, the original paintings in the ceiling, four of them, are from 1895. Likewise, the painting above the proscenium arch is from 1895. We have all, of course, those elephant's heads, which are very famous. We have 12 of those. Um, they were all restored. Uh, and there are stories of, in the past, uh, early 
on in the theatre's uh, history that when people didn't like whoever was on stage, they used to break off the tusks and, and throw it <laughs> on stage. And that doesn't happen any longer, thankfully. But we had to repair all of that because 125 years millions of people through the auditorium during that time that did require a lot of work. All of that beautiful decoration on the front balconies was all painstakingly restored. And the ceiling itself took four months. Uh, We had to build up scaffolding in the auditorium to allow the restorers, who were specialists obviously, uh, to, to restore that fabulous ceiling. Let's talk about the programme because um, it seems it's just a West End hit after West End hit. I, and, and that was a deliberate policy of mine. So when COVID struck, uh, I clearly, along with every other theatre chief executive, had to move quite a lot of programming. In fact, I think I've moved around about 30 weeks of programming from 2020 to 2021 and so forth. So I sat down and I thought, well, clearly COVID, we knew at that time, was going to go on for some time. And there comes a point when you want to try to encourage as many people to come back to theatre. Uh, and that's why I, I, I program so many West End uh, shows. We have Her- Spray, we have Grease, School of Rock, uh, Waitress, and the titles just roll on right to the next summer. And of course, everybody's talking about Jamie, and everybody really is talking about Jamie. Yes, uh, that will be with us on the 9th of March. But then, of course, balancing that with the musicals, then you've got brilliant ballet, Scottish ballet doing the Nutcracker. Um, so with any programme at the Grand Opera House, there's a bit, a bit of a tried and tested means of something for everyone. Mm. And that's what I've, I'm continuing to do. Let's talk about uh, Panto as well, because uh, for many families, it is a tradition coming here to the Grand Opera Opera House every year. Sadly, we didn't have a panto last year. It's very sad, and of course that did have a big impact on the theatre's finances. So we simply lifted the production of Goldilocks and Three Bears, and we will be doing that production in the next couple of months. In fact, I had a, a, a recent script meeting uh, with one May McFetridge. Uh, well, when I say script, Robin, I mean there's words on the page. Whether May <laughs> sticks to that, an entirely different thing. Uh, um, so the production is all ready. The cast is ready. We have um, all of the production elements all signed off and we begin rehearsals in five weeks' time. And of course, every year as well, you try to... Um, do something above and beyond with Mae McFetridge. And uh, I think the last time I was here, you had her flying um, across the auditorium in a helicopter. Yes, so in the last couple of years, uh, she's flown in a helicopter, as you say. She's had a a sports car flying into the auditorium (laughs) as well. I won't spoil the end of Act One and the pantomime this year, um, but when people go to see it, they'll realise why I didn't put Mae McFetridge into the last scene, but that's all I'm saying. It needs a bit of a specialist act. To, to be able to do what we're doing at the end of Act One. Well, Ian, it's been great talking to you, as always. Um, thank you for having us today. Thank you. So, of course, uh, there's loads of uh, fabulous uh, West End shows coming to the Grand Opera House. For full details on all the shows, uh, check out their website at www.goh.co.uk. Now, from theatre, we're moving on to TV. And how many hours a year do we spend deciding what to watch? Let's find out, because we're joined by TV critic Boyd Hilton and also behavioural psychologist Joe Hebbings. Guys, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So let's start off with you, Boyd. Uh, tell us then about this new research. What have we discovered then? Well, this research is uh, conducted by a now the streaming's TV service. And as you say, they found the, the, the kind of headline result is they found that Brits spend 100 days of our lives deciding what to watch on television. Um, the average person wastes 24 minutes, 24 seconds per week finding TV shows to watch. And a typical week sees us adults watching seven hours of TV and almost five hours, five hours of movies. Um, so the fact is, and I as a TV critic can absolutely confirm this, that there's, been mo- there's more stuff, there's more great stuff available to us to watch on television than there ever has been before. And it's therefore more important than ever that there are ways of curating that. There are ways of sifting through it all and picking out the best stuff to watch. And that's what now is done in their new kind of um, handpicked collections. 
Joe, let's come to you because I'm one of these people who, who do get overwhelmed uh, deciding what to watch, what movies to watch, what TV shows to watch. So why is it where we are scrolling for so long then? What do you think about it then? Well, look, we know that the quality of our TV is excellent. Uh, we also know how important TV has been to people through lockdowns. So we have quite high expectations uh, of what we're going to watch. And we've got trailers and we've got things on social media. And we've got people talking about stuff. And we literally don't know where to start. So we've got 49% of people, which is a staggering number, who actually don't watch anything at all because they spend too long fretting about what they should watch. So it's called the paradox of choice. So it's like anything at all. If you go into a shop and you're after um, a box of cereal, your local shop, and they've got 10 boxes, you will find the cereal that you want very, very easily. You pick it off the shelf and there you go. You go into a massive superstore, 200 boxes of cereal. You stare at them all. You go a bit goggle-eyed. You don't know what to choose. Too many, too much variety. And so, and that happens to us in our everyday lives in all sorts of situations. So with now, they have taken the best of the best in different genres. You know whether you want to watch a documentary or a series or sport or a movie. Generally, the genre is the thing mainly that it takes what we watch. So when they take the best of the best and put them into groups, your choice has come back down to your 10 boxes of cereal in your local shop, basically. It's much, much easier to make a choice uh, than the vast array of your superstore. And of course, there's always a worry that we're going to be disappointed. That's always in the back of our minds as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you've got great stars these days doing TV. I mean, one of the key things is nostalgia. It's, it's familiarity. Again, it was a very key, knowing who the stars are in these various films and dramas. That matters to us a lot. So we know we're likely to be less disappointed if we know the cast is, is, is a brilliant cast and they're familiar to us. And also, you don't want to waste any more time watching something for 15 or 20 minutes and then finding, nah, it's not for me. And then you've got to go on to something else. So again, this curation process, this hand-picking process that now does prevent some of it. You don't want to like everything, obviously, but it diminishes perhaps the likelihood of disappointment. Okay, let's bring Boyd back in now as well because we mentioned there about uh, we're getting some great uh, movie stars now popping up on these great TV series. One that I've just finished is uh, Kate Winslet in uh, Mayor of Easttown, which I thought was amazing. Completely agree. That is one of the TV shows of the year, one of the, especially in, in, the, in, the, in the drama category. And the fact that Kate Winslet, a huge star, one of the biggest stars in the world, not only stars in that, she exec produced it. She was, you know, very, very closely involved in the making of it. And it was completely riveting from start to finish and I, I, I did think when I saw Mare of Easton, I thought nothing can beat this like in terms of TV drama then along comes The White Lotus which I don't know if you've seen that which is currently on now and that is equally good um, a completely different kind of show there's you know a, a riveting look at the divide between the rich wealthy elite who go to this Hawaiian resort and the people who serve them and it's such a brilliant idea the cast of that is great um, so it, th another show's come along that is just as good and is just as riveting and is just as beautifully made as Mayor of Easttown. And as well as all the new shows now, we're seeing more nostalgia popping up on our TV channels now and we're able to watch classic TV shows from the 1980s. I mean, I, I've been watching things like Starsky and Hutch and uh, TJ Hooker, shows like that that are definitely worth a rewatch. You're right there. There are so many classic shows to watch. Um, there are also There's also things that tap into um, that nostalgia Wonder Woman 1984, for example, which is in the which is in the new and upcoming section, that blockbuster film taps into our nostalgia for the 80s brilliantly, and I love the way that you know that is a kind of celebration of that era. I'm, a man of my age, particularly obsessed with the 80s, um, so that you know I love the fact that that's got this kind of nostalgia element to it. It's really clever, and it just adds to the whole enjoyment of that show. I think completely. And I think over the past um, year or 18 months as well, we've seen more promotion for uh, documentaries, and uh, we, we've really been enjoying some of the great documentaries on Netflix and on the Sky channels. Yeah, there's a category in the Now in the Now handpicked collections called The Best of One-Offs, which is all about these kind, those kind of documentaries. There's Framing Britney Spears, which took a really, I thought, absolutely explained the situation with Britney and her conservatorship and all of that, what she's gone through in recent years. Fascinating documentary. Friends, The Reunion, possibly the TV event of the year. You know, that's there in, in the Best of One-Offs section. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I think 
TV about other TV shows and TV documentaries about these uh, iconic celebrities, that's all there as well. And of course, we've all become obsessed with their real life crime and uh, real life murder as well, haven't we? Fictional crime, true life crime stories, we're absolutely fascinated by. Um, I mean, those shows, no, I think it's no accident really that Mayor of Easttown, which you mentioned, the flight attendant is another example of a yeah. show that begins with a mysterious death. This flight attendant wakes up in bed with a with a, with a deceased man. What the, what the hell has gone on? Even and even the White Lotus actually has this mysterious body in a coffin being wheeled off in the very first scene. You're like, well, which character is that that died? I think we, we I mean we're understandably fascinated by mystery, aren't we? And that and and, and these all, these shows and along with true crime and fictional crime series, it's it's inherently fascinating. Let's bring Joe back. Uh, what have you been watching recently on your TV then? Because I have to do a lot of duty of care and psychological assessment behind the scenes, I have to watch the shows that I'm currently working on. Um, so there's a bit of reality and a bit of documentary going on there. But again, I love The White Lotus. So for me, I have to really be picky because I'm forced to watch, not forced to, obliged to watch TV shows that I'm working on. So I have really limited time to enjoy uh, anything else. So actually for me to have that curated hand-picked selection, and I'm particularly fond of documentaries and dramas, does make life a lot easier because I think, okay, that when I have my free time, not my obligation TV watching time, that's where I'm going to. So absolutely loving The White Lotus at the moment. Do not want it to stop. Oh, brilliant. As a psychologist, uh, what's your thoughts on uh, reality shows like uh, Love Island? Uh, well, I work on many of them, so my <laughs> thoughts are it's my job. Um, and that I do think it's very important that their welfare is protected. So that's what I do. I make sure that they can cope. I mean, obviously, social media is a very tough place at the moment and people are really kind the ones who the good people on there you know the kind good decent people tend to go under the radar and it's the the big characters the villains of the piece that that get the most grief so they're the ones i am trying to support the most through reality tv uh, i think some people go on there for genuine reasons some go on there for fame um and i do try and try and get a good balance of people that, that go on on shows like that. All right, just to finish on, I'm going to put you on the spot now to save us uh, spending hours scrolling through the TV channels tonight. Give us one program that we should definitely watch tonight then. I can't avoid the, the White Lotus. It just is, it's bowled me over as to how good it is. It's an absolutely brilliant show and it's, and it's currently there on now, definitely. Okay, I'm on it tonight. Joe, I'm going to put you on the spot as well. What should we all be watching tonight then? Well, if you haven't already seen it, watch Framing Britney Spears. most extraordinary documentary that gives an insight into everything that's going on. One of the most amazing documentaries I have seen in a long, long time. So I highly recommend it. Great stuff. Well, guys, it's been great talking to you both. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Robin. Cheers. Thank you. So we're still here in the brand new refurbished Grand Opera House here in Belfast. I'm pleased to say that uh, the bar, the famous bar that overlooks Great Victoria Street is back. I'm going to relax and have a drink. While I do that, I'm going to play you some great local music. This is new from Amberlight and it's called Nothing Lasts Forever. In a dream I dreamt last night under the morning light Hand in hand with you But your eyes could see right through In another state of mind Somewhere far and left behind Reflections on this glass don't lie Of a life I've tried to hide In the darkness there won't die As I fight to see the light but I know deep in my heart it's over. The guys that cast the rules we knew, yet I broke them all for you. The truth will always break right through. Nothing lasts forever. I've shown your hand, my money spent. The time we had was heaven sent. The devil always gets his rent.
seen right through your mask All the times I tried to ask Answers falling on the floor I've become what you ignore Now, moving on to fashion, and our very own Pauline Carval has been catching up with TV presenter Carol Smiley. Here's what happened. So today we're talking clothes for the over 40s. And today I'm going to be speaking to Carol Smiley, TV presenter, about how you can get clothes and good clothes to fit. So this research has been done by Kaleidoscope, the women's clothing brand. And I think they're quite shocked to discover that 91% of women um, have felt a pressure to dress in a certain way according to their age. Age appropriate is the term. I hate that word appropriate because it really annoys me. But um, basically, either a family member or a friend has said, oh, no, you should wear that because it's A, B or C. Um, and that's quite sad in this day and age because, you know, we are, we are, yes, we're over 45, but we're still people and we still want to look good and we still want to feel good. And if wearing this makes me feel good, why do you have a problem with it? Absolutely. And you know something? I had the same experience the other day. I was dying for one of those big padded coats that all the young ones wear. Uh, you know, to go out in the winter and feel like all cosy with the hood and all up. And someone said to me, oh gosh, no, that, you're a bit old for that. And I was like, but isn't that the whole point to feel young and sprightful? So, so absolutely. So are you surprised by the outcome of the research? Um, I'm surprised that it's so high, I think, yes. I think there's always been people around that will kind of go, don't we should be wearing that? But I, I'm surprised that so many women feel that pressure. And I, because I don't think guys put pressure on each other like this. Mm. I think we're quite hard on other women. And with the world of social media nowadays, you know, random strangers can pass comment on what you're wearing, which I hate. You know, when I was doing television, there was no social media and I'm so grateful for that because that, it's hard not to see that and be upset by it when you think oh I thought I looked, I thought I looked all right and now now this person I've never met before has really spoiled my day I think oh you shouldn't let that happen. What do you think can be done to widen the, the age representation in the media? First of all we have far more role models than perhaps we did when my mum was my age you know, she was in her 40s, she was already embracing the elastic waistline and probably not really bothered about what she, well, she was bothered, but she was a little bit invisible beyond that. I don't think I appreciated that at the time. There weren't, there weren't the opportunities to buy nice clothes for your age that comfort, that are comfortable, but actually flatter the areas that you feel less happy about. So I'm flattered that my kids will sometimes borrow my clothes. However, sometimes they put them on, I think, oh, I used to look like that in it. Keep it. <laughs> Siphoning off all my nice clothes. Um, but yes, I still think they're, uh, uh, denim is a staple part of all women's wardrobes. It's just finding the one that fits you because you can really fall down on the jeans, can't you? You can wear something you think, oh, I'm so uncomfortable. 
<laughs> or I look like a bag of washing in these, so I think it's probably time to ditch them. Absolutely. So what do you think can be done to make shopping more stylish and comfortable clothes easier? Well, we live in a very modern world now that we can order things online. We can try them um, at home in the privacy of our home if we feel not happy about going and standing. You know, sometimes in a shop changing room, and the lights are brutal. <laughs> Why have they not learned to put flattering lights in, in dressing rooms that make you look good? They haven't. Anyway, so you can, so much you can do by ordering online. We have great role models nowadays. You know, the stylish women like Helen Mirren. She's a lot older than you, but she's closer, to, I'm closer to her age. But I certainly look and I think, yeah, you can rock that leather jacket. And I would never have thought a woman of your age could, but look at you. You look amazing. Um, we need more women like that, older women in, in the media and in, in, on TV, sort of, you know, uh, rocking a, a personal style and loving it because I think that will give us more confidence to do the same. Because hair's another thing that, you know, my sister said to me a few weeks ago, oh, um, I'm, I'm going to start getting my hair cut shorter because older women can't wear long hair. And I said, well, not really, as long as the hair is in good condition. It, it, it's okay, you know, it's, it's, it's all relative, you know, but with all the things that we can do these days with Botox and everything, you know, why, why should we not be able to do these nice things for ourselves? It's your body and your life Life. don't let other people dictate what you want to do because if you know the only time I've ever really changed something that is because I already had the niggling thought that I wasn't really sure about it so if, if my husband or one of my kids went hmm that's interesting I think oh and I see yeah and I I really need to I'll just change that but I wouldn't change it if I loved it I just wouldn't yeah. where can people go to get some more information about this then all they have to do is go online to kaleidoscope.co.uk and the full range of Feel Good Denim is on there along with hundreds of other outfits. Thank you so much, Carol, for speaking with us today. It's been a pleasure. All the best. Now, earlier on this week, I met up with firefighter Ricky Nuttall, who was uh, one of the firefighters who was on the ground at uh, the Grenfell fire tragedy in London. He's got involved now in a brand new charity sporting event called the Gratitude Games. Let's find out all about it. OK, we're going to find out now about a brand new sporting event that's been created to um, thank our emergency responders and uh, support their mental health. It's called uh, the Gratitude Games. And I'm pleased to say that uh, one of the ambassadors for the Games is also a serving firefighter and a PTSD survivor. Ricky Nuttall joins us now on the line. Ricky, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Robin. How are you? Very well, thank you. So first of all, tell us about uh, the Games. How did all this come about and what exactly are the Gratitude Games? So the Gratitude Games are part of a bigger organisation, a charity called UK Emergency Services Giving. The idea of the charity is to provide um, a mental health support network for any and all emergency service workers UK wide. So it's something that doesn't exist currently and it's something that is desperately, desperately needed. Now, the games themselves will form an annual event, um, 20,000 competitors, all from an emergency service background and their families. Um, there'll be over 20 events taking place, in, including athletics, golf, equestrian events, all the, the, the usual sort of things that you'd find at Olympic Games. And the idea of the games is to form the basis of the fundraising alongside a crowdfunding campaign we've currently got going. So tell us about that crowdfunding campaign, because obviously you need the money to get the games up and running, don't you? Yeah, we need we, exactly that. We need the money initially, which is why we're asking people to donate. And if they want to, um, you can go to crowdfunding.co.uk forward slash gratitude games. Um, and, and again, the reason we're doing this ultimately, and, and as you quite rightly said, I'm a, a PTSD survivor. And the reason we need this is because I found in my personal journey, at, at my lowest point, the support that I needed was only there in part. And the support that other emergency services service workers need is also only there in part. There are uh, currently one in four emergency service workers consider suicide or feel suicidal or have felt suicidal. One in, that's a quarter of everybody that comes out to help you on your worst day. 
And that, that means there's clearly a shortfall. We need to bridge that gap. Exactly, because we always think of guys like yourself out there doing the firefighting work or emergency responders. My dad was a firefighter as well and uh, was involved in saving lots of life. We always think of you guys as heroes, but we don't think what happens when you've stopped doing that heroic work and you go home at the end of the day. Yeah, well, something I, a sort of a phrase that I've coined, which became so, so true for me and was, to be honest with you, something I hadn't considered until I attended the Grenfell Tower fire, which is... Emergency service workers leave incidents, but the incidents don't leave us. We, we may leave the scene of, of that accident or the fire or the, or the assault or the medical emergency, whatever it is, but we then go home to our families and are expected to perform a superhuman feat of not letting those things affect us. And it's simply not possible in, in so many cases for, and for so many people, you know? So, as I said, there is a desperate need for, for more support and hopefully through the Gratitude Games and the public support um, and support of companies, we will be able to provide that. You mentioned there the Grenfell fire. Obviously, you were on the ground um, when that happened. I remember watching the scenes unfolding on TV. It was horrendous to watch, but uh, for you guys watching that firsthand, I can't even imagine what you were going through. Yeah, the it's a strange one, really, because I think any emergency service worker, when they're in the midst of the incident, we are solely focused on the incident and providing a best possible outcome for the people that we serve. Um, it's the aftermath, the days, the weeks, the months afterwards, that you find out whether or not that incident has affected you. And, and unfortunately, there's no rhyme or reason to that, it doesn't seem. Um, hopefully, again, through... Gratitude Games and UK ESG, what we're going to be able to do is provide support to the existing charities that provide support to the emergency service workers, NHS care, um, police charities, uh, the firefighters charity, and we'll be able to provide some funding towards them providing a better level of um, intervention, intervention care. So the immediate aftermath of these events, rather than waiting for those incidents to become problems, deal with those at an early stage so that they don't affect people's lives. And of course, by raising awareness of this as well, of course, it would be great to maybe end up getting some government funding and, and some bigger funding to help this as well. Yeah, um, it, government funding would be lovely. Um, hopefully, hopefully in, in the future, it is something that we're working on and hopefully in the future, we'll be working closely with businesses through sponsorship as well as the government to try and secure a, a level of funding so that, as I said, we can continue to to put the games on initially, which is going to be April and May next year. Um, it's going to be hosted by the cities of Manchester and Salford. Um, so yeah, w with, with a bit of luck and a lot of hard work and a lot of generosity from the people that we go out to help, we'll be able to provide this support and put these games on. Okay, so coming back to the Gratitude Games, who can participate then? Any emergency service worker, from, from and that, that goes from... Highland Rescue, RNLI, prison staff, police, fire, ambulance, NHS workers, blood bike, you know, you, you name it. If, if you do a job where you come into contact with trauma and you're providing an emergency service, then you can participate, as can members of your immediate family. Okay, give us uh, the website details. If people want to find out more information, if they want to register their interest. Um, yeah, if you want to do that, just go to Gratitude Games. If you go and jump onto Google, Type in Gratitude Games or UK Emergency Services Giving. You'll find all the information you need, all of the links that you need and everything there to offer your support. Well, Ricky, the very best of luck with uh, the Gratitude Games and uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thanks very much, Robin. Take care. In 2022, the Gratitude Games has been hosted by the cities of Manchester and Salford and there's going to be over 20,000 emergency responders taking part in 20 sports over 18 days. It's open to people of all sporting abilities from all across the emergency services. We would love as many people as possible to get involved. So to enter, donate, volunteer or share, please visit gratitudegames.uk today. Time for some more music now, and this time round, an Irish singer-songwriter who's now living in Canada. Here's Mary McShane.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for on the big show this week. A big thank you to all of my guests. And, of course, uh, thank you to Ian and all the team here at the Grand Opera House for having us here today as well. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah.